From deep inside the dust storm, Larry Larson. I'm Ed Richards. And I'm Mark Krasinovich. And welcome to Defrag Tools. So Mark, thanks for being here today. Thanks for having me um, on. I want to get to the most important question first. Last night you were talking about how you went to a Star Trek convention. That's right. And you met Neil Armstrong. Yep. I just wanted to know what character were you dressed up as? <laughs> I, I'm not telling. Okay. No, I'm just kidding. All right, I didn't fair enough. Up. I've seen the photo and I'm yeah. not going to disclose it. <laughs> and you're a Next Generation fan, yeah, right? Next Generation, yeah. Okay, I tried to watch the old series with my daughter. Yeah, and, and Voyager, by the way, too. I like yeah, Voyager. Yeah, yeah. I, and I, I watched uh, an episode with my kids and afterwards my daughter goes, why was his cell phone so big? <laughs> so I was like, oh, forget it. Yeah. We're not watching this. Yeah, but they were using tablets on uh, Next Gen. Yeah, so. they, yeah, they had the common sense to yeah. have uh, the Envision uh, tablets with pens, I yep. should add, too. Yep. So good on that. So awesome. So, uh, Andrew, what are we going to talk about today? we got a couple of uh, new Sys internal Yeah, we haven't, we haven't had Mark on for, well, for ages. Yeah. I, think it was, I think it was like... Build Never 2012 call or something. Yeah, where, where's the dating happening? And um, there's been lots and lots of tools come out over, well, for months. And so I just printed out the last, I don't know, five major releases. I thought we might just go through some of the big boys and all the big features that have, uh, have happened. So maybe jump into a favorite you've got. Yep, well, um, we can start with Auto Runs, which is a lot of people's favorite. And I think you've got everything on the path here. So we'll flip over to, whoops, not OneDrive. Oh, OneDrive. Never mind. We'll do this, Auto Runs. And Auto Runs, for those people that haven't used it, is a tool that will scan a whole bunch of auto start locations on a Windows system, looking for places where code, drivers, plugins get activated. Every time you boot, you log in, uh, you launch an application like Explorer or Internet Explorer. And one of the new, relatively new features is there's a timestamp here, which is the timestamp of the image. So if you're looking at a system and you know that something screwed up on it, in the last week or so, you can look at the timestamps and That's narrow the time, down. That was the time it was compiled or the it's, time it was put to disk? It's the time, the last modified time on the disk. Okay. So it should reflect the time that the auto start entry was updated or created. So that's one of the new, relatively new features, but one that I, we just posted, I just posted yesterday is the WMI tab, which is going to be empty on most systems, but a lot of the entries that you see in auto runs actually evolved because we saw, or I saw, and me and Bryce saw malware using the various vectors to install themselves. Yeah. What the malware authors do is wherever they have the flashlight shined on them, they're like roaches, they'll go someplace else and, and hide there. And so, for example, print providers, the reason that's there is because malware are using print providers. LSA providers, that's also because of malware using that. And most recently, this WMI tab exists because we've seen malware, Microsoft seen malware in the last six to nine months that is now installing auto start objects in the WMI database as a way to activate when so the system like a, starts. It's like a WMI provider or? It's, a, it's just WMI entry. So you can create a, an exec entry in there and run a batch file, run an executable. And oh. so now what this tab will do is show you that that stuff is there. Cool. Um, my favorite, yep. <laughs> Procdump. Uh, Procdump uh, has been uh, kind of uh, not released for over a year because it's been refactored and um, added two, uh, two kind of new features. One was that um, it now captures dump files when something crashes and it can install and uninstall uh, itself for doing that. And so um, we just do, actually I'll do this. Um, if we have a folder, for example, a dump folder, you can make prompt dump, capture a full dump, when something crashes, and then you'll get a file in this folder whenever something happens. And actually, I've actually got one, which ironically is a WMI crash uh, from yesterday. And so that way you can see what's, what's going on in your system and maybe work out that you've got some bad DLL or something, some like an auto start type program, yeah. a print provider or something that is, instead of it being a malware thing, it can just be an annoying. Something that's causing uh, unreliability on your system. Yeah. The other thing um, that's in uh, version seven is reflection. And so you can now take a dump uh, in the background with with the system wide. So let's say you're playing a movie on Xbox video and you want to take a dump file for some reason, the video will continue to play while in the background uh, it's done uh, yeah. in the background. So that's kind of cool. Uh, access check. Access check. So uh, Aaron covered access check in depth in his talk yesterday afternoon and he actually spurred me to add some new features to this. So if we run access check, the new feature is to show the uh, file shares, which, I mean, I can't remember which switch I added for file shares, because this is one of those tools like yours that's filling up. Yeah, it's got every uh, letter of the alphabet. 
the tool where Fisher retires when it. Oh, well, there it is, dash H. Red. So the reason I can't remember is dash H was kind of like, yeah, oh, that's not really intuitive, but it's the only one of the only letters left, and uh, I guess H is the second letter in share, so I'll just use that. But if you run access check dash H, and say star, it's going to look at all the shares on the system, and a lot of people maybe not don't realize that there's a bunch of hidden shares, including admin dollar, which people are familiar with C dollar, but then you can see this one has been created by, uh, looks like Config Manager, uh, as well as this one, and this is the name pipe share for connecting to this thing through, through using name pipes, and then the, the print server share. So this way you can see if there's misconfiguration on these, and Aaron in his talk showed how at a customer site, he, they ran this on their systems and found uh, a vulnerability in one of the shares cool. that allowed people to spread. Uh, SigCheck. SigCheck's one of those ones which is a bit boutique, but it's so powerful as well. Yeah, so SigCheck has undergone a lot of changes. And one of them is if you, if you just type SigCheck, or which uh, sys? Uh, it's under uh, my oh. sys internals. My sys, in, no. Nope. No, my, my slash. This. My, oh, my slash sys internals. No. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not letting it wait long enough. All right. Okay. So if we run SigCheck on a utility, it shows that it's like a file version uh, tool. So it'll show us that this thing is digitally signed. It'll say what the publisher is, who signed it, in this case Microsoft, and the uh, name and version number of this thing. Also, this is, a, uh, again, Aaron requested this because he's been troubleshooting a lot of 16-bit image problems. Mm. So now this will report the machine type, and even if it's ARM, it'll also report the, that it's an ARM uh, image. But one of the cool things that I added was this, which is the dash V switch. And if you put this with the dash R switch, what this does is connects to an online, it's basically, a, it's basically antivirus as a service. This is asking me to agree to the terms and conditions of virustotal.com. Virustotal is a service that lets you upload malware or images that you're suspicious of, and it'll perform an uh, automated scan against 40 or 50 antivirus engines, Microsoft's antivirus engine being one of them, and report the results of it. So what's interesting when you look at malware is that not all the engines are aware of the malware. They don't have signatures for them. So even something that's a, a pretty virulent virus spreading out in the world might only have 20 of the 40. And so this makes uh, it great because your own installed anti-malware might not be aware of it, but if you upload it to a virus total, you might see others that have already flagged it. Nice. So what I've done is, that's the terms of service, uh, it's got a virus total link here, and if we enter that link, we can look at the results of the scan. And actually, well, which is already reported as zero to 52. So somebody's already submitted this particular image. If somebody hadn't submitted this, and by default, uh, Chig Check with a switch will submit the, the file up with the dash S on there. So you can put VSR, and then it'll submit the upload the executable, which it won't do by default because you don't want to be doing Sig Check on your documents folder and uploading all your corporate documents to yeah. VirusTotal. And so you, it'll ask you to explicitly specify the submit switch. So this is a great way to easily hunt down malware. Run SigCheck uh, with the dash E switch, which says only scan executables, with the dash V switch, the dash S switch, and point it at your, the root of your C drive, and it'll scan everything and, and report. Uh, and the dash, uh, what's the switch? Uh, there's a switch here that only looks for ones that are unsigned. Dash U, what am I doing? So if you, if you do dash U, if dash V, it'll only dump ones that are detect flagged as either unknown by virus total or have a non-zero detection by virus total. So now, I remember you saying at some point that the minus E for executables is not based on its extension name, is it? You look, actually right. look at the header of the file. Yeah, so we could actually rename zoomit to zoomit.txt and sigcheck dash E Z, it'll still catch it. To pick it up, yeah. yeah. Um, there's also a file entropy thing. What, what's that? Oh yeah, so file entropy. Actually, I don't think you've got the latest version because it's not, sh oh, that dash A. So we need to do dash A if we want to see file entropy. And what file entropy does is, you can see there's a file entropy on Zoomit of 6.516. Entropy is a way that forensics, that anti -ma uh, uh, malware forensics people use to identify potential malware because the entropy on malware 
is usually very, very high. It's yeah. because they're using compression and encryption to try to obfuscate what, what's in there. If you look at most of the images on a Windows system, typical binaries have an entropy that's between six and seven. If you look at compressed malware, encrypted malware, oftentimes seven and a half or higher. And so this is another just signal as to try to figure out if something's potentially malicious or not. Great, I wish we had more time, Mark. Oh, we're out? Uh, we're oh, going to the so next much more. session, so oh. gonna uh, go to the hot room, and thanks for joining us. Which is, uh, it's not C, because that's checking an actual catalog. Oh, I forget which one. And I you laugh at me, but give know, me a question of Brock Dam. Uh, show catalog name and image signer, dash I. Uh, where is it, dump? There, T. So it's always been able to dump the, the, certificate, the, the certificates that are on the chain, the signing chain for a particular image with the dash I switch. So if I do dash I on zoomit.txt, it'll show all the signers up to the trusted root here, Microsoft Corporation, which signed the Microsoft Code Signing PCA cert, which signed the Microsoft Root Authority cert. And then you can see the countersigners, these are timestamp countersigners on that, so that validates the timestamp of this thing. But one of the things we've also seen malware do is they'll stick a fake self-signed root authority into the trusted certificate store, and then any images that you look at this way and you say which ones are unsigned, it'll show up as signed and trusted by the system because the, this malicious root is trusted by the system. Stuxnet went the other way, right? They stole someone's root. They actually stole, which is root. even better. Yeah. yeah, It's even better to steal a root. So what did I say that, that switch was? T. T. T for dash T. <laughs> so this, um, actually it's dash T, and it takes the name of a, a store, and if I say star, it dumps me all the stores, like the machine CA store, the, see, oh, the personal, up, line. the personal, the auth root store. There's a bunch of different stores, both on the, the machine certificate stores as well as per user certificate stores, and so if you do the dash T, and it's actually, checking these things. I decode uh, the o OID, the OIDs, to human readable form, so to match the certificate dialog. Oh, we so. don't have to remember them? <laughs> yeah, you, some, of them you, some of them are undocumented, which is really annoying. Oh. Um, so. so if there's multiple users, can the tool go across all profiles? Or just, have the, just, just the, the current profile. So if I do dash TU, this is looking at your, so you can see user address book. Yeah. So you'll see a cert in here for your, that's been assigned to you, probably by MSIT. Yeah and it's do, doing a res resolution of the trust. Can, can you use PSExec to go other users? You, uh, can you use PSExec to, yeah, you can, because you can use PSExec, specify user account, specify the local account, and say you want to load the environment, and what that does is load the registry high for that user in that session. Cool. Uh, talking PSExec, PSExec, uh, something to do with encryption. Yeah, so PSExec in this Snowden uh, era, uh, PSExec lets you run tools on a remote system, like if I said remote, uh, command, then that would get me a uh, command, interactive command prompt from that remote system on the local one, so I could type in dir and other commands as if I was sitting on that remote system. And up until this release of PSExec, both that channel of the talking, unless you have IPsec on your network, that channel was unencrypted, as well as if you specify alternate credentials like Andrew and your password, it's, I think it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. No, it's channel nine. Oh, it's channel <laughs> nine, yeah. It's uh, C9 at Microsoft, right? Yeah. So if you did this, uh, this username and password would actually be passed in the clear over to the other side, which, you know, it's going over your internet, you shouldn't be doing this over the internet, so there's not not a whole lot of risk in general of being sniffed, but if you do have at local admins or you have malware that's sitting on the network and scanning for passwords flying through there, yeah. then this is a w an exposure. And so a lot of people said, hey, can you, what about PSExec? It'd be great if you weren't passing this over the clear. So with this latest release of PSExec, it encrypts all traffic going to the other side, except for the initial command, uh, as part which it can't, because it needs to do a handshake with the other side to so get the secrets exchanged. But how does it get its... What's the protocol to get it onto the far end? Is it using, is it using IPC dollar sign or something, or? It's using uh, admin dollar sign. Admin dollar sign. Yeah. So I've, if you find PC that isn't working, it might be because admin dollar sign's been taken off? That's typically, you don't have file print sharing enabled, or you've uh, disabled admin. Ad well, admin dollar share is there by default if you enable file print sharing. Gotcha. But. 
So uh, what malware or malware method have you seen that just made you say, wow, that was pretty Oh, incredible. actually, yeah, there's a pretty cool one that I'm going to show in my talk tomorrow morning. Yeah. It is um, Serifef. It's a piece of malware called Serifef, and the way that it, once it gets on your system, it gets admin access by hijacking the Adobe Flash installer, up, install updater. So what you see when the malware activates is you see Adobe Flash saying, I need to update myself with the USC prompt that looks with the blue, trusted, Adobe, Flash player, you say yes, and what you've just done is given the, ad, the malware admin credentials. Yeah. And the way that it does that is there's, there's a lot of code that, will, that looks in the current directory for a DLL. And so what it does is drop a malicious DLL for a common, the replacement for a common Windows DLL into a temporary directory, sets the Adobe Flash player installer, its current directory to that, launches it, and so when it goes fishing for that DLL, instead of finding it in System32, it finds it right there, and it's the malicious one, loads it in, now the malware is sitting there elevated as part of that elevation. Mm -hmm. So that was a pretty clever technique. The WMI one's another interesting one. Yeah, how prevalent are these? Uh, Serif is actually pretty prevalent, so yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, I expected to see these kinds of sophistication a long time ago, so we're yeah. just kind of seeing more of this now. Yeah, okay. PS Ping? PS Ping is a tool that I wrote for Azure for tr troubleshooting network issues between virtual machines and Azure and just looking at the traffic into, from outside the cloud into Azure. So PS Ping uh, I wrote because there was no other tool that I could find, at least that was intuitive, that did all the things that I wanted to do when it came to, to looking at networks. So for example, I could do a PS Ping of Microsoft.com Microsoft and we can check out the latency Got to Microsoft.com from Andrew's system here. And this is like a, a standard ICMP ping, except this is doing a TCP connection, mm -hmm. seeing how long it takes to establish a TCP connection with the other side. And so you can see it's about 60, 70 milliseconds. Because so, most sites don't have ICMP turned on, so yeah. if you try pinging Microsoft. Yeah, if you, if you don't specify a port, then it's a standard ICMP ping. There's only a few places that have ICMP turned on, and actually I'll show you one of them. Because I looked around to find ones. New York Times has it on. Uh, CNN has it on. Oh, Yahoo. Yeah, you can ping Yahoo with ICMP pings. So, uh, and the other thing about this is you look at the timestamps on it. Let's compare that with the standard ping. The, you can see this is 76 milliseconds, whereas here you're seeing sub millisecond resolution, which is what I wanted to. When you're working in on uh, local networks, then sub millisecond resolution is important. Every bit yeah. makes a difference. Yeah. Uh, the other things it can do are a bandwidth test, though. It can be do bandwidth and latency, and that requires you to install PS Ping both on the target and the, the server. But unlike other tools like NTTCP, have you ever used that tool? Yeah. Yeah. So that I, one I requires. I'm using now, but. Oh uh, yeah. That requires you to enter this complex command line on the source, and then another very complex command line on the target to uh, to actually get them to talk to each other. And I found that really obnoxious. First of all, it's bizarre command line syntax, and then you got to remember, oh, it's the client, I need to do these things and server that thing. Mm -hmm. With PS Ping, you just run PS Ping dash S. You tell it which, um, well, PS Ping dash, like if I'm doing, oh, it's been a while since I ran this too. Uh, <laughs> let's see, dash T, uh, dash question dash T. So if what you'll do, it, oh, it's dash L. Let's do a latency test. So it tells you on the, on the server or the client, here you specify PS ping and then dash S with the source and a source port. So if I do IP config to look at what endpoint I want to listen on, of course, I can do this. And then I'd, and, whoops, PS ping dash S. I have to specify a port here, and it has to be a port that's open on this machine. Here, so you want me to open that up? Probably not. Nah. So there. <laughs> so it's really not accessible at this point, but it's listening there. And if I then go to another machine and I do a PS ping, I can do bandwidth tests against that. I can do latency tests against that. I never have to come back here and mess with the, the target like you do with tools like NTTCP. So that firewall dialog popped up. Was that it responding to the request, or was that the new firewall feature that you have in PS ping? That's the new firewall feature. So PS ping actually explicitly tries to open the firewall up. And the dash F actually, if if you don't have that feature turned off, dash F will pop, will do it silently. So if you've got admin rights, yeah. 
then dash F opens that port for the duration of the test. So it's open right now. If I do control C, it'll close that port back up if it was cool. closed when it started. And I think I saw somewhere it's just named PSP or something in the firewall rules. That's roles. right, yeah. Yeah, if we, we could, you want to take a look at that? I don't know if you have time. Where's advanced firewall? No, it doesn't like it. Huh. Let's try firewall and you might, you might be able to see it. Here, we go advanced. advanced. Yeah. And if we go to inbound rules, because this is going to be an inbound rule, and this takes a second to refresh. So there's PS ping right there. Cool. Awesome. Cool, and I saved uh, my favorite for last, Process Explorer 16. Yeah, Process Explorer 16, the granddaddy of them all. Process Explorer, of course, a task manager type replacement is tool. It, is it more your favorite than Process Monitor? Uh, no, Process Monitor is my favorite, yeah. Process, process Monitor, the number of cases that are solved with Process Monitor, uh, mentioned this, yes. When did we, we were talking about this the other day. Yeah, yeah when in doubt, run Process Monitor. Yeah. They, I, uh, I had that slide in my deck yesterday in Hardcore yeah. Debugging. I actually used Process Monitor to solve, a, to solve the case in the end rather than looking at the dump file. Yeah. I, I put the David Solomon slide up there. I made everybody chant it yeah. as they should. Good. Indoctrinating the, the masses yep. to know the power of Procmon. But Process Explorer is a fun tool too. Uh, the, the levels of depth that are in here, I think most people aren't really aware of. But w I mentioned the Virus Total feature, which is the first tool that I integrated with Virus Total. Process Explorer is the second tool that I integrated with Process Explorer, and I made it really, really simple for you to do virus checks on your family's computers. You just come in here and you say, check virus total in the command here. It's going to say, I, I, I can enable virus total results in the option menu. So I go to options, and I go to virustotal.com, and I say, check virustotal.com. Of course, it's going to ask me to check, make sure I check the terms and conditions. And then once I have, it's submitting hashes for all of the images that it's showing in the display here, and within a few seconds, we should start to see these things come back with reports from VirusTotal, and you can see them right there, and actually there's something flagged by some antivirus engine. So if you look at this monitor.exe, which some is the back monitor application, we don't see a company name on there, which is kind of suspicious. Yeah, that's so a, you know, give me take a look at the uh, strings on this to see if we can find uh, a uh, US stuff.com. <laughs> Yeah, so it's an iCatch cam, PC camera console. Oh, you can even see the source path. So they're using Visual Studio 8 to build this thing. So that's a uh, 2000. So it looks like it's a camera, some kind of camera thing. Nice. Uh, and if we spend a few more minutes, we could probably figure out which company made it. But we can d click on that now to see which antivirus engine detects this and what does it think it is. And you see nano antivirus, which sounds like a very reputable antivirus. <laughs> reporting this thing as a WS game crofic. Uh, chances are that's uh, false positive. But yeah, this hope so. <laughs> yeah. I like how it changed color, so it kind of... Uh, yeah, so you can see it, yeah. So is that one of the things you do now? If someone says, can you look at my PC, is this one of the very first yeah, things definitely. you do? Yeah, definitely, yeah. And then what's next? What do you do after that? Uh, SIG check, I'll do auto runs. Uh, so I haven't integrated auto runs, SIG virus total into auto runs, but that's the next thing I'll do, kind of major thing that I do. And it was a fair while ago you added auto runs location to uh, Preston Explorer, so on the tab, if, if the oh, process yeah. was started by an auto run or is associated with an auto run that so plausibly was started, yeah. started by an auto run. That's right, this, this I added probably a couple of years ago. This is auto start oh, location. Hasn't years, has it? Well, maybe, I don't You're know. You're aging me. <laughs> it's a year and a half, maybe. Yeah. But if you look, this is, uh, so it, it built, Process Explorer builds from shared libraries that are also, that auto runs is also built from, and so it'll perform scans if you enable that of the same auto start entries that auto runs does, and for any match here, we'll show you how that thing is activated. So this is just as a little piece of trivia. If you look, well, how does Explorer get started? It's registered here in HKLM software, Mi Microsoft Windows NT current version, Win Logon Shell, which is the app that Windows will start when it, it user in it starts when it, creates your user session for your interactive user session. It'll look in that key and start whatever that's pointing to. Yeah, so if you change the explorer to exe to cmd.exe, all you'll get is a command prompt. Command prompt, right. Uh, which, is, which is what uh, basically safe mode build yes. does. Safe does, mode command yeah. prompt. Yeah. So is there a jump to, to auto runs from here? Or is that something you have to do kind of manually? Uh, I don't remember. I don't, I don't think there is. Uh, change yeah. request? Yeah. <laughs> 
Nice. Oh, wait, there's a jump to this, though. If you go to Properties and you go to Image, this will show up here as well. And if I say Explore, that'll take me to that place. And oh, then, boom, there's the shell right there. So we could change it to Command. That's kind of cool. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Anything major coming down the pipeline? It's kind of odd, like, not remembering how to use my own tools. Yeah, you might <laughs> it's like, well, you, you, People are like, did he really write those? But you're so <laughs> prolific. That's the problem, right? You, yeah. So. Is there anything coming down the pipeline? Uh, like I mentioned, just auto runs with the um, SigCheck, with the virus total integration, that's going to be the next big thing. Yep. But then a bunch of you know, uh, enhancements along the same scale that we've been talking about. Yeah. yeah your I'm book? You want to mention your book? Yeah, the uh, book, Rogue Code, out May 20th. And here, uh, available at the bookstore here at TechEd for, for people early, which is... For double the price? No. Yeah, for double the price. <laughs> Actually, you can get it cheaper online than you can at, uh, from the retail, from a retail store. Well, thanks but, for being here. Really yeah. appreciate it. Thanks. Come see us more often. All right, thanks, Love Larry. Love having you. See you, Mark. See you next week.